Hey folks, just a quick heads up at the beginning of this episode that uh, Isaac does refer to a man named Leonard Casely as Leonard Casey a few times. The correct name for this man is Leonard Casely, and the correct title for this man depends on whether or not you recognize his serenity. Now, on to the episode. This is Demetrius Spinrad. And this is Isaac Meyer. And you're listening to Criminal Records Podcast, a podcast about some of the weirdest cases in true crime history. And we are not moving to a weekly schedule because that would kill us, but we are releasing another episode a week after we just released an episode uh, because we skipped a week for 4th of July. And speaking of independence... That's right. I yeah. Hear, I hear that we have a case today that will make everyone think about becoming an independent country of their very own. Is that the case? That is true. Uh, I am on lead for today and I'm taking us to our first, I believe, micronation case. Uh, so these are the cases of unrecognized, very tiny countries out in the world. Uh, and I'm really excited to do this one. This is also another listener suggestion. Uh, listener Lachlan uh, sent us this and a few other Australia themed episodes. Uh, so, if we, you know, as we uh, as we look about plan, I look for plans going forward. Uh, I think I might return to this well a few times because there's some really good Australian history to work with here. Uh, it's also a great time to remind everyone we do uh, look at the listener suggestions. We're not always great about replying to people because we do very nicely get a lot of stuff but uh if you have ideas you can send them to us and they may end up as episodes um yes is this the first time we have actually done an episode set in australia instead of an episode about sending people to australia i believe it is yes um and it's also it dovetails nicely with another two-parter i am working on uh for reasons we will get into towards the end of this episode uh, but I figured it was a good kind of lead into some of the mindset we're going to be talking about uh, when in a couple of weeks uh, we turn our attention to that case, too. But first, we should talk a bit about Australia. All right, this is our first case in the land down under, and I promise only to say to do the accent a couple times. Uh, so we should quickly note, of course, Australia has a very long history of human settlement going back conservatively around 50,000 years ago. Uh, which is very interesting, the history of the Aboriginal population of Australia, how they got there, how their society evolved over time. A lot of great academic research being done there, a lot of great history. We're not going to get into it because it's not directly relevant today. And the story of how uh, the Aboriginals of Australia were treated is a very different and much more depressing story than what we're going to tell today. Um, we're going to focus instead on how Australia evolved into the country it is today and how that enables uh, the creation of one of the most famous micro states in the world. Um, you, of course, probably know that Australia was largely settled by the United Kingdom in terms of the period of colonization. Uh, it's not the first European country to get there. The Dutch actually beat them there. Uh, Dutch explorers from the Dutch East India Company make it to Australia in the early 1600s, but they decide it's too remote. Uh, and while it's clearly big, it's not clear what kind of resources the landmass would offer to exploit. Uh, and so they just kind of do some charting. They give up a couple places names. Of course, that's why, for example, Van Diemen's Land becomes a thing. Tasmania becomes a thing. Those are all Dutch names. Um, but it's really uh, about 100 years later that the British decide it's worth trying to turn this place into a colonial outpost Thanks primarily to who else but the Americans. Uh, the 4th of July enables the creation of Australia, as it is today in a certain sense, uh, because after losing the United States, the UK needs a new dumping ground for its malcontents and troublemakers uh, now that America is no longer available. It also has a lot of really pissed off loyalists uh, who don't go in for all this newfangled Republican nonsense and need a place to go now that they are no longer welcome in what is now the United States um, while they wait for this whole Republic flim flammery to blow over, which I'm sure will be any day now. 
the age of colonization is so interesting because there's some colonial powers that have too many people and not enough land and other colonial powers that have a ton of land but actually are in constant need of people to be to be the settlers on the new land that they're trying to conquer and england is going through its own weird thing that we've talked about in some other episodes where its population is going through this massive explosion and there is not enough work for all of them. So England is very good at exporting people right now. And they really, uh, you know, they have a lot of people to export and a lot of reasons to export them. And those reasons uh, start with also the French, uh, who, of course, have a, have a thing with the English, historically speaking, uh, and are in the midst of their own push into Southeast Asia and Indochina, uh, as well as some of the Pacific Islands. And so, of course, the British being who they are, they're immediately like, we need our own larger bases in Asia to deal with the fact that the French are building their own base in Asia. Uh, and so the plan to settle Australia uh, is increasingly championed by two guys. The first is the Secretary of State, Lord Sydney, the namesake, of course, of Sydney, Australia. The second is a very interesting fellow, James Matra, who is an American sailor, uh, a loyalist, so he's left the country after the revolution, of Corsican heritage, uh, who'd been part of the James Cook voyage to Botany Bay when it was first scouted by British explorers, what's now the site of Sydney. And he says, I've been here. I can take people back. Uh, and so he gets support from Lord Sydney to take 300 convicts and their families to the site of Botany Bay to create what is supposed to be a self-sustaining uh, colony that can then be a place for transportation to send malcontents where they will not drain the resources of the crown. Uh, yes, if you are not Australian, your primary association with Botany Bay is probably a bunch of sea shanties about being sent there against your will. Uh, it's obviously the SS Botany Bay, the ship in which Khan Noonien Singh is sent into space when he's then discovered by the crew of the Enterprise. Wait, that's that's what they named it? Yes, in that the is show? what they named it in the show. I can't believe Star Trek is written by nerds. I know, it's shocking. Uh, speaking of nerdy things, Australia, uh, that initial site, the Botany Bay Settlement, what becomes Sydney, uh, will, thanks to the magic of 19th century imperialism, lead to a settlement that spreads around Australia and that forms into six self-governing colonies, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, and West Australia, because they ran out of good names, I guess. Uh, and starting in the 1840s, the British will also start to grant Australia more self-government. This is also around the time transportation gets abolished as a punishment. Uh, and so there is this increasing level of pressure as Australia uh, is no longer being settled mostly by people who are being transported, but by their descendants, uh, the white residents of the region who very awkwardly start calling themselves Australian natives. That's their term for themselves. Uh, they start talking about federalizing, combining the six states of Australia into one shared Australian territory. As the region continues to grow in population, they see this is a way to make those six independent colonies more important on the global stage by combining into one nation. Federation is eventually approved by referendum in 1898. Parliament in London signs off on it in 1900 and thus is created Australia. Uh, it does pick up two new provinces from the six colonies in the offing, the Northern Territory, which was carved out of Southern Australia, and the Australian Capital Territory from New South Wales. But that more or less brings us to Australia as it exists today. And that's important uh, for our story because it's the reason that Australia is what we call a federal constitutional monarchy. So it has a parliament, a bicameral parliament, but both houses are elected, so it's not appointed lords like Canada or the UK. Both houses are elected by the people of Australia, but the monarch of the United Kingdom, in this case, uh, old Charlie Boy himself, uh, remains the official head of state. Australia is a Commonwealth nation. The 15 states in the Commonwealth accept the British monarch as their head of state. That's part of what gets you in the Commonwealth. Yes, can you can you explain some of the technicalities of the fact that it is a Commonwealth country and yet it is not part of the UK? It is a completely independent nation. So the thing that holds the Commonwealth together is that all the Commonwealth member states say, you know, there's two roles basically in the executive side of government, the head of government who does all the day to day stuff and the head of state 
who is the like symbolic figurehead. The chief baby kisser is kind of the way I think of the head of state. I'm not sure if I want King Charles kissing any babies. Well, you don't have a choice if you're a Commonwealth state, because part of the rules for being in the Commonwealth is that whoever the British monarch is, the head of the they're the current seated British mo- seating British monarch, is also your head of state. That's basically what gets you in the Commonwealth. That also includes some like free movement clauses. It's easier to move from Canada to the UK than it would be from America to the UK and get a visa, for example. Um, and some trade agreements, too. But the big thing is they all share the monarch in common. That's also why India, for example, even though the British, you know, decided that, you know, didn't like fight a war over staying in India. uh, The Indian people, for some reason, were not too keen on keeping the British monarchy even in a symbolic role. So it is not a Commonwealth state, even though the ask was uh, or the uh, the offer was given to them, is my understanding. (laughs) <laughs> of course wow that's the first time britain ever gave india anything yeah i mean well you know you take you take sometimes you have to give i guess uh but it doesn't mean they want it um day to day of course charlie's not going to australia that much and so the role of the monarch is filled by the governor general who is appointed by king charles uh or whoever the you know whoever the monarch is on the advice of the prime minister But King Charles, practically speaking, he has a couple of ceremonial roles in the government of the United Kingdom, but he's not for practical purposes doing any governing. No. So what exactly does this governor general do? Uh, They have theoretically a great deal of power, um, just actually like the British monarch theoretically has a lot of power. But practically, those powers are by convention in the case of the UK or by the terms of the Constitution in Australia uh, exercised according to the advice of the prime minister and the cabinet. So realistically, none of those powers can be used without the approval of an actual elected official. It's this weird, again, kind of political Frankenstein's monster thing where you have these powers that were historically associated with the monarchy that theoretically still exist, but now are controlled in more democratic ways. Okay, so he's there to be a figurehead of the figurehead. The governor general, yes. I love legal systems. It's a it's a real trip. All right. Speaking of trips, let's talk about farming. Who loves who loves farming? Uh, <laughs> I know this is the kind of wild content you, you all come to this podcast for. Fantastic, flawless segue. Uh, well, it's actually it is interesting, I should say, because it's actually hard times to be a farmer in Australia in the 1960s. I know we all feel for the working farmers. Uh, new technology is opening up new land to farming. It's raising productivity. 1968 to 69 is actually a record-breaking year for the wheat harvest in Australia. And that's actually bad, believe it or not. You don't want to be breaking those records too much. Already, agricultural prices worldwide are kind of all over the place. Uh, the United Kingdom back home has just joined the European Economic Community which means uh, it's had to standardize a lot of its policies around trade with other EEC members. So it can't give special treatment or trade deals to the Commonwealth, or those deals have to be renegotiated. So there's more competition for Australian wheat now from European wheat. Farming is also a really hard business because it's very reliant on agricultural prices. Those can vary a lot. And if there's a boom year, prices go way up, or excuse me, supply goes way up, Prices actually go down because there's too much supply. And isn't this also a uniquely weird time specifically in the agricultural market? Because there are several countries that Australia cannot be trading with that are also producing massive amounts of wheat. Yes, there's some complicated stuff around the Soviet Union, for example, of course, has a big agricultural industry. But trade, because of the Cold War, is more complicated than than it uh, otherwise would be. Uh, and that actually leads to, uh, alongside things like the OPEC embar- uh, oil embargo in the early 70s, uh, which, of course, oil is a big part of mechanized farming uh, and competition from the United States, uh, a really weird period where the wheat price starts to kind of crash and actually hurt the economy, even though and kind of because there is this uh, this wheat surplus. Um, side note, actually. When we talk in the future about uh, some radical movements in the United States, we're going to see that some of those in their early incarnations are driven by farming crises in the 70s uh, and price fluctuations. So it's kind of a similar uh, a similar setting, but a very different outcome. So 
Uh, Australia is very dependent on its agricultural sector. In 1960, it's uh, 30% of the economy, so it's a big deal. And wheat is the single biggest export uh, in the 20th century. Today, less so. Agriculture is only uh, the mid-teens in terms of its percentage of the economy, but still a pretty big deal. And so uh, keeping food prices stable is a big issue for Australia, both because large numbers of people are employed in the agricultural sector and because, you know, people want to buy food. And, you know, that's good. So like the United States, Australia has a system to try and stabilize prices. Uh, like the U.S. had introduced that system during the Great Depression. Uh, it's called the Australian Wheat Board, which is basically a state-run company that manages wheat production quotas to create price stabilization. They tell farmers, you can only sell this much wheat. And it's what's called a single desk system. So the only place you can sell your wheat legally is to the Australian Wheat Board. They buy all of the wheat, which is intended to keep prices uh, level to ensure a steady demand. And then they manage both the domestic and the export market. So if you're an Australian farmer, you have to sell to these guys and they will tell you how much you are allowed to sell. So on one hand, this is a good deal for the farmers and, you know, it's not going to completely crash the prices. But on the other hand, if you're a farmer, you own a certain amount of land. It's not like you can just say, oh, I'm just not going to deal with this chunk of land during this during this growing season. I mean, you, you can do that. You can leave some land fallow, but it's not like your expenses go down if you farm less of your land. So on an, on another level, this is actually maybe not the best deal yeah, for farmers. Like, yeah, the impression I have is that the people running the AWB actually are not experts on farming. And so they, you know, there are ways you could make a system like this work if you plan far enough in advance, then people can use the land they're not using for wheat to, you know, harvest something else. I don't know. Maybe in an orchard. I, I, I'm not really a farmer. But... If you give them enough advance notice, they can work around that, right? That yeah, you know, that makes sense. Not how the AWB does it. Uh, I found some interviews from ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, on the price stabilization scheme. Uh, one from 1972, quote, we don't know what our quotas are going to be until after we've sown our crops. Uh, if they were announced about 15 months in advance, that would be about right. You can prepare for it then. Otherwise, you can't prepare your ground accordingly. Uh, from what I can tell, people got about six months notice before the harvest, which is not enough time. Oh, no. Oh, no. So the the plants are already growing. And then this government agency comes in and says, actually, we're just going to make you force some of this food that you're producing to rot. Pretty much. Uh, it's not a great system, um, even though it does work for its intended benefit. But the farmers are the ones who can eat the loss here. Uh, again, from the same interview, this is with a different person, but the same uh, the same article and the same interviewer. I'm very bitter. My husband, too. We've, uh, we've worked hard to get where we are today. We went through the drought and we felt we'll go on from here. And then all of a sudden we get the wheat quotas. Farmers don't expect a handout, but if they can be helped to make a new way of life, I'm sure they'd be quite happy. We feel that if the wheat quotas hadn't come in in this way and we'd been given some warning, uh, we would have found it was possible. It wasn't possible to continue. Uh, then we would have got out. Then we would have got out with a roof over our head. But now it's going to be terribly difficult. And this is purely a quota system. This is purely about what you can sell. There's no attempt to build up any kind of strategic stockpile if there's a surplus. There is a stockpile in place for price stabilization, just like with the maple syrup cartel. Uh, but that's you know, you're you're still have a limited amount you can sell to that based on your quota, and it's not going to be that stockpile is not all the wheat that could be harvested in a year because it won't last. Uh, side note, the AWB, because of these issues, will eventually be privatized in the 1990s. Uh, and then it will have a giant scandal in the 2000s when actually its executives literally do the thing from Arrested Development Season 2, where they get caught illegally selling wheat to the Iraqi government of Saddam Hussein. What? Yeah, they literally did the light treason bit from Arrested Development, but with wheat instead of model homes. That is such a weird. <laughs> that, how? I mean, wheat is is not exactly what I would call a easy to smuggle commodity. I mean, 
once you got flour, it is a white powder, but it's not really something you can sneak into a country with well, nobody noticing. They did it. Saddam Hussein needed that wheat, and so they circumvented a bunch of UN embargoes to sell him wheat. Wow. Okay. So where exactly are we going with this massive di digression into wheat? What does the King of England have to do with Australia's wheat supply? Or I guess the Queen of England at this point. Yeah, at this point, point it's, it's still the Queen, yes. Um, and specifically, we're going to go back to 1969, Western Australia, and in particular, a chunk of Western Australia, about 595 kilometers or 370 miles north of the nearest big city, which is Perth. That land belongs to a farmer named Leonard Casey, who was born in the city of Kalgoorlie in 1925. Uh, he was a school dropout at 14, working for a shipping company before he served in World War II in the Royal Australian Air Force. Uh, and then after working uh, in shipping for a little while longer, purchases a farm in the 60s because he wants to get in on the wheat industry. Right? He wants to get back in or he wants to get into farming because it is a growing industry in the 60s. But. Then he runs into the Australian Wheat Board. In November of 1969, he gets his quota, right? Uh, and it's November. Remember, we're in the Southern Hemisphere. That's the start of the growing season. His quota is 1,647 bushels of wheat for a total of 18,500 acres of land, which is 29 square miles or 75 uh, square kilometers. According to Casey... That quota would have meant that it would take 500 years of farming just to produce the same amount of wheat he'd produced in the last 20 years from this land. And the value of sales wouldn't even cover the cost to buy his tractors, let alone his mortgage. So it's literally just completely economically untenable. What? Are they going full on medieval peasantry levels of crop yields here? Yeah, I'm not sure how they calculated these. Um, and from what I can tell, there's also not really an appeal system. Like, it's genuinely kind of a weird, like, I get the notion here. I understand the economics. It does seem very poorly implemented. Okay, so there's this guy who ha he owns this farm. Most farmers are, are in a pretty large amount of debt, really. Like, they're very, very land poor. And he has no way to make that money back because the only people he can sell his wheat to are not buying and don't seem to understand how wheat works in any way. So what I'm going to do now is read Casey's actual words uh, from what came about what came next. Uh, and I'm just going to read this at length verbatim. The matter of an appeal to remedy this situation was immediately considered. It was found that the Western Australian government had no legislation to judicially validate this action. However, there was a wheat quota bill before Parliament being discussed. That bill contained two clauses which were of grave concern. One, no appeals would be allowed against the quotas granted, and two, no compensation would be allowed for any losses suffered as a result of quotas. These clauses strongly clashed with the law, stating that, quote, her majesty is liable in tort as a master to a servant, unquote, and were considered as an attempt to deny a certain section of the public its rights in law, making it imperative to lodge a strong protest against the wheat quota prior to the bill becoming law, for if this were applied against them, uh, the farmers, in the letter of the law, no protest would have been allowed. So... I think the bill he's talking about is the Wheat Delivery Quotas Act of 1969, which is a state legislation in the Western Australia Parliament. Uh, side note, I'm going to screw this up a lot because the acronym or the um, shorthand being used here is WA for West Australia, which is also the shorthand for Washington State. And so my brain is just going to do that a lot. Uh, that bill did get passed uh, to reinforce the quota system. That's what he's talking about. The whole Her Majesty is liable in court thing. I do not know where he got that from. This principle that Her Majesty is liable in tort as a master to a servant. I cannot find the law he pulled that from. Uh, I looked in, you know, uh, in Google and law books I could find. The only thing I could find is a single thread on a discussion board talking about Leonard Casey. It is true that in Australia, like all, all Commonwealth countries, it's legally customary that the monarchy and its representatives enjoy only a limited degree of sovereign immunity. They are liable for torts, civil damages uh, for their actions, unless the law expressly states otherwise. 
the idea is to say that nobody, including the monarch itself, is, or the monarch themselves, is above the law. Uh, but I do not know where he got that phrase from. Is he, in a really weird way, mangling the fact that when one brings a legal suit against the government of England, it is against the crown? And I, I believe, again, in Australia, too, because it's a commonwealth. I am honestly not sure. Um, and most of his legal battles will actually be against the Australian tax authority. More on that in a second. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure where he got this from. But of course, you know, as he says here, he tries to appeal all of this. He tries to appeal the quota. No one will hear him out. And so now he's convinced that his uh, his rights are being violated, specifically that he has a type of tort, a type of civil claim against what is called unjust enrichment. This is an actual common law term. That is a real legal term where one party benefits from the labor of another without any sort of legal restitution. Uh, this is also apparently an area in Australian law where what counts as unjust enrichment is still kind of being hashed out down to this day. But I can see the argument here that, right, that there is no that the wheat board is benefiting from Casey's labor and being able to limit his output to protect their own prices. But he's not being repaid in kind for that. Um, Casey also makes a separate argument in a letter to the Governor General of Australia uh, in November when the quota comes in, basically saying the government doesn't have the legal right to tell me what to do with my land unless those uh, limits that you want to put in are in the land title. You can't just pass a law changing that. That's not how common law works, uh, but nice try. Yeah, it does sound like he is trying to solve a very legitimate problem at this point. He is just not going about it in a way that makes any sense, possibly because the law really has backed him into a corner where there is no sensible way to appeal this completely bugfuck insane thing that the government is doing. Speaking of sensible, let me read, uh, let me read you the end of that letter. Quote, and wherein the government have so acted, which is against uh, against us and not in our protection, that you should take some land held by the West Australia government, whose rentals will thus be a fair settlement of our losses, thus being brought about by the wheat quota, and further to which wherein the government have acted against us and not in protection for us, that in your so granting us said lands as compensation, that you also grant us our independence under the Queen and as a part of the British Commonwealth. The land we would propose is a reserve and station country, in large which would incorporate our existing holdings, have sea frontage and a reasonable balanced source of income from its various sources and poten uh, potentials. Uh, it would not be adverse in any respect to the Australian Commonwealth, and should we consider be of some benefit. We see this as the only means of amicably rectifying what the government is doing against us and to us. Oh, no, okay, now we're getting interesting. Now we're getting very interesting. So he has just proposed his own settlement to this problem, which is that he gets his own state within Australia, yes. separate from Australia. I'm unclear where this new state he's creating stands in relation to Australia. He is planning to secede from Australia, but not, note, from the British Commonwealth, right? He still wants to be under the British Commonwealth and have the Queen as his head of state. So Casey, also you may have noticed, like I quoted that verbatim, he writes this kind of legalese to try and make everything sound very official in a way that just comes off very confusingly and kind of like he doesn't quite understand what's happening here. Uh, and that's really magnified, I think, on April 21st, 1970, uh, in the document Leonard Casey sends to the premier of West Australia, uh, where he says, quote, in accordance with the rights of the Magna Carta and the rights of the Atlantic Treaty and the international rights to newly formed self-preservation governments resulting from actions deterrent from the principles of unjust enrichment and the West Australian government's further enforcement of a retrospective penal act, contrary to the Commonwealth government's promise to the people of Australia through the United Nations, it is herewith declared that as no objection has been directly judged with myself during the last five months against ceding from the state of Western Australia that the Western Australian government having concession of fait accompli is herewith duly accepted. The settlement of session is thus formally called for to be ratified by Sir Douglas Kendrew, who is the uh, governor general in the name of the queen as her representative. 
Oh man, he's citing all the big guns. That doesn't make any yeah, sense I, whatsoever from Jesus a legal perspective. Fucking Christ. But this is Man, he really got all the big ones in his sources. This is just a word salad here. Um and oh god. So basically the claim is no one has told me I can't do this after I said I would five months ago. And so I'm just assuming you're okay with it. I'm going to do it, uh, which is, you know, the goal of the West Australia government in as much as anyone was aware of his plan, I think, was basically just ignore him and hope he just gave up. And I'll give him this. He didn't do that. Uh, as for all the precedent he's claiming, I don't know where in the Magna Carta he thinks you get the right to just secede if you don't like paying taxes. Uh, uh, not doing that was very explicitly part of the Magna Carta, right? The only thing I can think of is that Article 8 and a few of the others say that you can't seize land to pay a debt if there are other financial means of covering it, uh, which actually means that even if you accept his unjust enrichment claim, the Magna Carta actually does say he can't just claim land from Australia unless there's no other way for the government to pay him. Uh, the Atlantic Treaty just isn't a thing. Either he's talking about the North Atlantic Treaty, which is the founding document of NATO. I don't think that's it. You know what? It it just might be. With this logic, it may just be. I think it is more likely he's talking about the Atlantic Charter of 1941, uh, which is a statement of goals by the U.S. and U.K. for their plans uh, during World War II. I assume he's referring to the second clause of the Atlantic Charter. Uh, th uh, they, the U.S. and U.K., respect the rights of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they will live, and they wish to see sovereign rights and self-government restored to those who have been forcibly deprived of them. I think that's what he's referring to, but also, like... Oh, if he, sovereign rights and self-government, eh? Like, I get that this is a shitty quota system, but if he's comparing dealing with that to living under occupation by the Nazis or Imperial Japan, like, go fuck yourself, honestly. Um, the self-preservation government thing, that's just made the fuck up from what I can tell. That's just not a legal term at all. It's not a right that's recognized in any UN treaty that I'm aware of. There's some discussion of the idea of government as a tool of self-preservation uh, in the works of John Locke, but that's a defense of property rights and the need for states to exist to defend those rights. Um, and, you know... That's why, according to Locke, the state has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force and therefore does have the right to force you to pay your fucking taxes and comply with wheat quotas. So so his justification for what he is doing is a mix of sources that do not say what he thinks they says. Sources that are misattributed and don't actually seem to be sources and the work of philosophers that are not actually laws. Yes, uh, he does also claim that the Western Australia Constitution Article 61 supports his case. That does say that West Australia can cede land, but only if it wants to form another province from that land. You can't just take it and unilaterally secede, because of course that's not in the Constitution. Who the fuck would put that in a Constitution? Um, oh, you know you know how they put the back button in the Constitution? If you just want to get on the out of there. Just the undo button? Um, yeah, no, this is... You know that constitutional prenup? Uh, I think, and yeah, I can't... This is me speculating, to be clear. There is a history in Western Australia of secessionism from Australia as a whole, kind of in the same way that you see that in some states in the American West and Midwest, this kind of notion of, like, this is the frontier part of Australia, not loosely tied to those big wigs off in, uh, you know, off in Canberra and Sydney and all those places... Uh, there actually was an independence referendum in Western Australia that did pass in 1933, but then also the people of Western Australia elected Labour, which was the anti-secession party, um, and it got tied up in this whole legal morass where then the UK Parliament was like, you can't do that because you can't change the Constitution on your own because we granted it to you, but also we can't change your Constitution on your own, and it was just a whole thing until everyone gave up. So maybe he's kind of building on that whole thing. I don't really know. From what I can tell, and put a pin in this because we'll come back to it in future episodes, his plan was just to bombard the government with a shitload of correspondence and basically annoy them into accepting what he wanted 
by just yelling things that sounded vaguely like legal precedent at him. Um, and really hoping that any level of response or engagement would involve then a recognition of his claims. All right, so how prepared is the Australian government to be over this man? How annoyed are they at these apparently just letters that he's sending about how he owns their land now? Yeah, I mean, it's complicated. Um... The official position of the government of Australia is just we're going to ignore this guy. We're not going to deal with him. By the way, at this point, he's referring to himself as the administrator of Hut River Province. The Hut River runs through his land. Uh, he's later going to start referring to it as the Hut River Principality and declare himself to be a prince. Uh, I couldn't find an exact date for when he did that, but it's not this early. It took him a little while. Um, but the, for example, the Postmaster General of Australia actually issues guidance saying that his claim is not to be taken seriously and consequently in drafting replies for the signature of the prime minister's private secretary. Uh, we have been careful not to include any reference to his self-imposed title. Uh, just acknowledge his correspondence, basically. Like, we have received your letter. I would love to know the logic be behind why he's the prince and not the king. I assume because uh, he is also a, like, he's keeping the uh, monarchy in place. There are a few politicians, though, outside of the PM's office who reply to his letters and do refer to Kaisley as the administrator of Hut River Province, uh, which he's, he's going to seize on in the future as recognition of his position. But the official position of the government is non-recognition. Uh, so, for example, we have a letter from Prime Minister William McMahon to John Tonkin, who's the premier of Western Australia, from late 1971. I would like to make it quite clear that the Commonwealth government does not recognize either legally or in any other way the existence of a self-styled province of this nature, nor can I envisage any circumstance in which it would do so. Uh, Tonkin himself would also say, Mr. Kaisley's land is just as much of the uh, part of the state of Western Australia and the Commonwealth of Australia as is my block on Preston Point Road. The so-called province can never hope to have any legal or political existence. Uh, and that's, again, basically the position of the Australian government, either to just reply to him by saying, we've gotten your letter, or reply back by saying no, or just ignore him and basically hope that he will shut up. Um, and it doesn't sound like he's bringing any actual legal action that they need to deal with legally in court. He's just sending these crank letters. So Australia is not legally obligated to respond in any way. That is true. Um, he does try a few non-court-based actions that he hope will get, hopes will give him some legal cover. Uh, so he actually forges ahead with minting coins, issuing a passport, and even making his own license plates uh, because he hopes that it will kind of give him some international legitimacy. If he can kind of act enough like a government, people will have to accept him as a government. Uh, my favorites, uh, he doesn't actually get any oceanfront property, just a river, but he does register an application for like the system for registering ships under your like a national flag so that you can like, you know, in the same way you can have a ship registered in the United States, you can have a Hut River ship uh, with its own flag and everything. He also has a guy in 1977, a supporter on a, a contest flight that surveys part of Antarctica who claims that part of Antarctica for the Hut River Principality by right of discovery. Uh <laughs> Uh, this is also why he starts calling himself a prince, uh, because he believes it gives him the legal cover to start harvesting his wheat um, and basically breaking the laws of Australia. He believes this because of the Treason Act of 1495. So he's digging deep in the legal precedence here. Uh, this is from the War of the Roses, and it's basically a blanket amnesty issued by Henry VII. Um, basically, if you fought for the winning side, you just get a blanket amnesty. I don't know why he thinks because of that law, if he makes himself a sovereign, then he is just immune to all prosecution. From what I can tell, that's not what the treason, like nothing close to that is in the Treason Act of 1495. I'm admittedly not an expert on that period of English law, but I just don't know where the fuck he got that from. But that's not my favorite trick he used to try and get recognition for his claim. On Friday, December 2nd, 1977, 
a telegram arrives in the Prime Minister's office. And that telegram says, the Principality of Heart River has declared war on Australia. What? And then another telegram arrives on Sunday, December 4th, 1977, saying that the Principality of Heart River has declared peace on Australia. <laughs> the th- oh my God. The theory here, apparently... <laughs> Kaisley believes that according to the Geneva Conventions of 1949, any nation that has never lost a war is entitled to full respect on an international stage. And now he has never lost a war. I did look through (laughs) the 80-ish pages of the Geneva Conventions of 1949, not carefully, admittedly, because I who has the time for something that stupid? I, that that phrase is not even in there, from what I can tell. I don't know. I don't know, man. I think this country has got it all. It's got an untenable amount of wheat. It's got a theoretically dominant navy. It's got it. Well, that navy has never lost a war. That, doesn't have any sea access. I just but I, hasn't lost. I love the idea that the Geneva Conventions, which are about protecting the rights of civilians in war also include, like, a legal secret cheat code in them where if you've never lost, like, if you've done the Dark Souls no death run of international politics, then you just get, like, bonus respect on the international state. Why would that be in there? (laughs) Anyway, and of course, the, the final stage here, Kaisley also starts reaching out to other countries to try and get recognition Uh, So there is actually a memo that goes around from the Australian Foreign Ministry to every embassy around the world that that they have to be like, okay, if you're the ambassador to like, I don't know, France or something, and the French government gets a letter from Leonard Kaisley being like, hello, please recognize my country. You got you you got to go talk to them like he's got to say he's a weird crank. Just ask him not to not to write anything back, please. Like it's. Generally, I can't imagine how embarrassing that would be. I bet that was a fun day at the office in like East Germany. Oh, my God. Can you can you imagine? Um, Actually, there's a uh, there is an issue with Canada because Kaisley starts issuing his own stamps. So the postmaster of Australia has to be like, don't take his stamps. So then he tries to route his mail through Canada, not because like he needs to send anything to Canada. He's just hoping the Canadian mail system will validate his stamps and therefore give him legitimacy. And so then the Australian government has to call up the Canadian post office and be like, hey, guys, you're going to get some weird stamps. It's a whole thing. Just just don't worry about it. Please tell me these stamps had wheat on them. I I actually couldn't find an image of the stamps, but I bet they're out <gasps> there. Oh, no, I I. <laughs> As crazy as this is, there is something there is something fascinating about this entirely wheat price based country. I, I want to know everything about just the general aesthetic. Oh, it's it's gonna get going to get weirder. For Don't worry. His coins. Uh, he, I can tell you about his passport because apparently the passport. This is another foreign ministry or a Department of Foreign Affairs uh, memo from Canberra. They note his passports are just the Australian passports, but they don't have the word Australia on them. Like it's the design is identical, except that there's no there doesn't say Australia. It just says independent sovereign state. That's the only difference. Wait, he doesn't put his he doesn't put his own country's name on them. Uh, I assume it's on there too somewhere, but they're like the just kind of crossed out. Okay. Um. But yeah, this is a whole thing that they have to deal with on the international stage. You have to go around to other countries. I know that Switzerland and Bolivia. Uh, do actually like send inquiries to Australia being like, uh, are you sure? Like, like, what do we do? Like, what do we do? How do we handle this? Um, (laughs) I assume some other countries did too. Uh, there are also some stories online and from others, uh, about about people being able to travel on Hutt River passports. We'll talk about who's getting them in a second. Um, but people claim they're able to get through customs with a Hutt River passport. It is also pre 9-11, so like the rules around flying were very different, you know, in uh, in the. I mean, this is this is pre digitized database of any kind. So that is true. If someone whips out if someone whips out a passport um, and you are, I don't know, some agent who's new on the job and you're like, 
I guess that's a country. Who's who's going to stop you? What what resource is there available to stop you from flying? That is true. I mean, you're no more likely to know that Hut River is not really a country than you are to know that Monaco is. Like, that sounds made up. <laughs> uh, and before we move on from the international thing, I do also want to note that Leonard Kaisley will lose his fucking mind because for Queen Elizabeth's 90th birthday, many decades later, he will send um, a letter to her you know, saying from one sovereign to another, a very, a very joyous occasion. And he does get a form letter back, but that form letter just apparently they plugged in Prince Leonard, which was his signature. And so he's like, the Queen's recognized me. I'm legit. Right? That's the kind of culmination of his whole strategy. I love that the Queen's PR people did not take a second look at anyone to whom they are replying as a prince. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's just a weird for a weird family name, you know? You don't want to assume things. So the thing that really makes Kaisley's case for himself, the reason he's able to get away with this for so long, is not his international strategy, as funny as it is that he did declare war on Australia and claim part of Antarctica for himself. Really, it's his ability to play Australia's media. Uh, he is very good at playing up the sort of David and Goliath aspect of his story with the Australian wheat board. And, and this is very clever, he hits on turning the principality into a tourist trap, right? Come see the world's tiniest country, get your passport stamped at border control, make it a whole thing. And you can also buy citizenship and buy royal titles. Isaac, I'm going to be totally honest with you because you know me and you've had to put up with you me would for absolutely a very long buy time. yourself a, like a title in a fake country. I don't know if I'd buy the title, but if a tourist trap like that happened to open near me, I would absolutely make us go. <laughs> that is fair. I want a passport stamp from a fake country. <laughs> and I mean, it works. I mean, you know, he, he only has 20 full time residents in the uh, principality of Hut River. Basically, it's his family. But. He's very good at bringing in tourists and you actually can you, if you don't even if you don't want to become, you know, have a title, you can get naturalized as a laugh and get a, a passport and the whole deal as a, like a souvenir. Right. But like, oh, I'm a citizen of Hutt River, or I guess a subject of Hutt River. I have spent more money on stupider things than this. I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, depending on how much it is, like that's not a bad souvenir, honestly. So word spreads pretty quickly. Uh, as early as August of 1971, the West Australian Premier is complaining to the Prime Minister of Australia that school children want to do research projects on Leonard Kaisley and his principality uh, because they've heard about this and they're like, oh, that's cool. I want to write a little paper about it. Uh, Kaisley gets a profile in Time magazine in 1975, playing up the whole like Australia forced me into a corner uh, in 1976, he goes uh, even more international in a Swiss paper. I'm going to mess the name up. Neue Zürcher Zeitung. I, I assume the New Zurich Daily. Um, and, you know, this strategy, it works with people. Uh, I found an interview with one of his subjects. Uh, he got himself ennobled as an earl. I guess Earl Pat O'Dwyer, quote, It began as a protest and a great laugh. At first, I thought the prince was a big nut. But people like his protest against the stupid bureaucracy, and that's why he's becoming more popular. So I have to ask, how genuine is he? I mean, he what what he's claiming legally is insane, but what he set out to do to protest this bureaucracy that is badly mismanaging the something that is very important to a lot of Australians. This does seem like it was a pretty successful protest. He did get a lot of attention to this issue. Yeah, I'm not sure, like, you know, how much he really believes I, he is legitimately a monarch versus doing a, like, 50-year performance piece. Um, he seems to have genuinely, like, he committed his whole life to this. He will literally die still calling himself Prince Leonard. Um, and, you know, is very kind of invested in the protection of the image but also gets into some kind of wackadoodle stuff, too. Um, so, for example, uh, he actually gets a paper in the area to echo uh, his idea that he's going to get overseas funding to build a casino, a yacht club, and an artificial lake uh, to then draw tourist bucks that way. Um, you know, He's very invested in trying to publicize the venture. Speaking of which, 
you know, this will keep going into the 90s. And you know what that means, Demetria? Does that mean that there's a brand new country trading with Australia? Uh, no, it, it just means that they decide there's one more way to try and boost their popularity and their recognition internationally. Check your messages from me. I have a link for you. Oh, <gasps> there's a website. There is a website. Oh, it's it's glorious, Isaac. This is Oh, why did we ever stop designing websites like this? How would you for the for our audio audience, Just, how would you describe this website? Uh, the most beautiful website I've ever seen. Peak web design. The tiled background, the bright teal uh in the back of the text, and then a yellow highlight on the black te on the uh, bright teal. Um the fact that it has to remind you that there are no pop-ups on the site. I mean... Oh my I, gosh. Everything... Oh my gosh, look at that GIF. <laughs> the GIF of the flag. Oh, it's waving so proudly. Everything about this is perfect. He's... I, oh yeah, my It's God. a clever strategy, admittedly, to stay current. And you can tell from how fucking GeoCities that website is that, like... He got in early on this, right? Kaisley was on building a website and trying to use that to build legitimacy for his cause. Uh, he does. Isaac, Isaac, I found I found the stamps. I found the stamps. I have the stamps. I have the complete stamp catalog. I, I can't wait. Um, I think there are some photos in there of the government buildings of Hut River, too. Oh, wow. There's a lot of these. Oh, so it's. Is one of those Jesus? I just clicked on one. It's a bunch of landscapes, and I think one of Jesus. Oh, birds of Antarctica. Re refining the territorial claim. Uh, state visit to the Vatican. Oh, there's a photo of him with... Is that... The... Is that the Pope? Oh, I think that's photoshopped. That is definitely photoshopped. I do not know what is going on oh, with that. Oh, he claims that there's a series here of Christmas ones uh, d designed with the permission and help of the Church of England. Oh, God, these are amazing. You know what's even better, Demetria? The Pyramid of Hutt River. Can I, can I show you the Pyramid of Hutt River? You know, I don't know what I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, this is about like a story and a half high tops. Uh, built by specialists and devotees in the fields of pyramids and pyramid energy uh, named Brad and Billy Wilkinson. Oh, oh, this is um, this is a weird scan that was really popular in the 90s. I think they built this in 2006. My, my dad was really into telling everyone about this, not because he believed in it, but because he thought it was so crazy. That does crazy. sound like there your dad. This, yeah, there was this weird new age movement that thought that if you placed things inside any pyramid shaped structure, they could not decay. I mean, that tracks with what I found on their website about the Pyramid of Hutt River, uh, which includes this actual quote. Brad, himself a severe sufferer of skin cancer, wholly believes his quality of life and indeed the length of his life has been greatly aided by the fact that he only drinks water energized in a pyramid. One of the many beliefs which also include relieve your, your pain, induce sleep, improve the water you drink, make your plants grow, deepen your ESP, improve meditation, intensify your dreams, etc., uh, pertaining to the area of pyramids and their energy, thus the reason and interest in carrying out further research. Um, there's a, oh God, it just goes on about the fucking pyramid and the magic of it. Uh, you can also buy crystals that were energized in the pyramid, pyramid, by the way. Yes, yes, the energizing crystals thing. So he's just sort of letting whatever new age freak kind of wander in. So and this do is their this thing. is my thing. Like, does he genuinely believe the pyramid is magical? Does he genuinely believe that the Church of England signed off on his stamps because they didn't tell him no? Does he genuinely believe he's a prince? Is he like just you know six sheets to the wind out of his mind all the time? I don't know. I don't. I can't crack yeah, maybe this he guy. Just got a free pyramid out of it. And yeah. You know, yeah. I. I, I, okay, so I'm really having a problem here, which is that I instinctively tend to dislike any sovereign citizen movement because they are banana crackers, um, which this guy, I mean, at least in his legal his legal arguments, it are. But usually what I really hate about sovereign citizen movements is that they are looking for an excuse to get around the law that is preventing them from doing something really horrible. And I just don't see any evidence that this guy 
wants to abuse any laws that are in place for a good reason. Um, that he seems very wheat price centric, and he was actually right about that. I mean, to be fair, after a certain point, honestly, pretty quickly, uh, he made way more money off of tourism than he did off of wheat. Right after a certain point, he just stopped harvesting wheat pretty early on because he discovered the tourist shtick of Hut River made him a lot more money. Um, and that's where I think maybe some of this is coming from, that what drives his economy at this point is just interest in his weird little project, right? After a certain point, the point of being the Prince of Hut River is not really to try and, like, fight the Australian wheat board. It's because being the Prince of Hut River brings people in as tourists and makes him money. And that is something that happens with a, a couple of different micronations. Like a few of them will sell kind of the equivalent of, of titles and merch and whatnot. Um, and as tourist traps go, honestly, like I said, I would be taken in by this one. I would visit the Principality of Hut River. It's really kooky, but it doesn't seem to be harming anyone. Uh, and that's pretty much the position of the Australian government, too, right? They're aware of this whole media strategy of the tourist money. Uh, and there are people who want to crack down on this guy. A World War II uh, Veterans Association, the 39ers Association, writes to the federal government basically saying, like, you got to shut this fucker down or everyone's going to try this. Uh, even politicians feel that way. A liberal MP that named Michael Hodgman basically calls for the prime minister in 1979 to deal with the Hutt River province. Uh, but the PM's office across many different administrations and many different parties always has a pretty consistent position, uh, which is summed up in Fraser's reply. There has never been a Hutt River province, and it follows, therefore, its existence cannot be terminated. All right. So this is, I, I would say, actually a pretty good response overall from the Australian government. But I believe you mentioned something about some trouble with the tax board. Yes, uh, and that's ultimately what brings this whole thing down. Again, for like decades, the position of the Australian government is no crime's been committed here because Hutt River is not independent. Therefore, you can't prevent him from seceding. He hasn't seceded. He's not an independent, like, this is not an independent country. And as long as he's complying with Australia's laws, we don't really care. Uh, I do want to note that technically he did break one law. Australia criminalizes, uh, quote, anyone who levies war or doesn't act preparatory to levying war against the Commonwealth uh, as treason. He did technically do a treason because he did declare war in Australia, uh, but he's never prosecuted for it for some reason. Well, apart from sending a telegram saying he was declaring war, he didn't actually commit any acts of war. Uh, but he runs into the trouble with the law a few different times pretty immediately. Um, Wayne Kaisley, or I should say uh, Prince Wayne, Duke of Nain, Earl of Tabor, Grand Master of the Serene Order of Leonard, uh, is fined 40 bucks for not registering for national service in 1972. His two eld or his eldest son, Ian, and his son, Leonard, uh, and Leonard himself, actually, uh, are fined for not voting. Uh, and he's arrested in 1977 for refusing to give documents to the Australian tax office. Uh, so they do run into some legal trouble. But he wins a false imprisonment cl uh, claim against West Australia for the tax arrest, but not for the reason he wants to. Uh, his son tries to bail him out five minutes after the end of uh, the end of like jail office hours and is not allowed to pay. And the government says that's unreasonable. So this is false imprisonment. Uh, but ultimately, the tax thing is what takes him down. Um, once Kaisley turns it into a full-time tourist trap, the Australian tax office starts investigating him and finds that he has not been paying taxes on any income from the principality since 1970. And it becomes this ongoing legal battle that takes literal decades to figure out both what is he withholding and how much does he owe. Uh, and the result is that in 2007, the High Court of Australia finds him liable. Uh, he tries to get the whole case dismissed, saying that he's not Australian. His lands are not in Australia. The High Court says that's not true. Uh, the, ju uh, the chief judge, Dyson Hayden, uh, calls his claims, quote, completely unarguable, fatu uh, fatuous, frivolous and vexatious. So some very good, uh, some very good uh, rebuttals there. And he'll lose a similar case against West Australia's uh, government in 2017. 
So as a result, in 2017, Leonard Kaisley owes 2.7 million Australian dollars. His son Graham owes another slightly under a quarter million Australian dollars to the government in back taxes. Oh, so this is this is a quite yeah. No, I was not endeavor. kidding when he said I said he made more on tourism than he did on wheat. Like he's doing good at this point. Uh, but his legal argument that the queen said I was a prince, so how dare you disagree with the queen? Which is actually an argument he makes in court does not work. I understand. I understand the problem that he has now because if he if he does pay his taxes then he's just proved that he is a citizen of Australia and the whole thing falls apart. Yes. Uh, and so eventually what he will do is abdicate in favor of his son uh, and just continue the legal battle. His theory seems to have been Western Australia's government is not going to march in and repossess my land because the press would be bad, but they're all, yeah, which is true, but they're also not going to drop the claim. You're just going to keep racking up his back tax debt and eventually start seizing his assets uh, eventually, Kaisley will never actually be defeated in court because he will die in 2019. Uh, but then in 2020, what happens to the tourism revenue? Oh, no. COVID happens. That's COVID is what brings down the principality of Hutt River. Uh, the tourism dries up. There's no more money to pay for lawyers or energy pyramids or any of it. And eventually... The new sovereign of Hutt River, Prince Graham, the son, the heir, uh, has to sell the farm to pay the bills. Um, he does keep the family archive, uh, and he seems very sad about this whole thing. Uh, in an interview he did with ABC, it's very, uh, it's very sad watching your father build something up for 50 years and then you have to close it down. Uh, but they're very harsh times economically and health wise around the world, and we're feeling that too. Uh, and that's yeah, that's the end of the Principality of Hut River. It shuts its doors. The land is farmland once again. The website is still around, hilariously archived with the help of the Western Australia government because of its historical significance. <laughs> oh my god! I just okay. I have to say one more thing about this website. So there's this Irish woman who call, who styles herself Dame Julia Galvin who travels around the world participating in novelty sports for the Principality of Hutt River. Um, so she's been in things like the stone throwing competition, the Christmas tree throwing competition, the 2013 bog snorkeling world championships, Damn. the uh, world wife carrying championships. Well, good for her then. She's she's even found love. Yeah. I Okay, Dame... Dame Julia, if you're out there, I want to hang out. You seem awesome. Do you have to carry your own wife or can it just be any wife? I would, I would, there's no rules saying a dog can't play basketball. Uh, I also I did look. I don't know what happened to the Pyramid of Hutt River or to the actual. This is really a thing. Um, the Prince, Princess Shirley's sacred uh, educational shrine um, to you know, for the the former uh, first lady of Hutt River. It is the gateway to nature's spirit world, uh, and there are pictures of it, and it is everything you'd hope it would be. From what I can tell, it's basically just picture. It's just um, a little wooden thing with like ceramic animals in it. Wow! Wow! Okay, so this was a nice amuse bouche for the sovereign citizen research that yes. you've been doing. Uh, which I think I think future episodes are going to go to a much darker. And yeah. So place. Uh, to get back to the foreshadowing from the front of the episode, the reason I started looking into this is because I am working on what is now a two parter on the sovereign citizen movement in the United States uh, and came across th uh, this whole whatever you want to call it, uh, in part because of that, because there is some similarity here also with the Reichsberger uh, movement in terms of basically just yelling things that sound vaguely legal and hoping th that people believe you. Um, there's an element, I think, there of that use of, like, legal jargon and precedence and just kind of dealing with, like, v volume of arguments, what's called paper terrorism, just, like, throwing enough paper at the government to try and shut down a conversation. Um, that there's, like, some similarities with the sovereign citizen movement there. Obviously, here, it's just a guy who wants to build weird pyramids and not pay his taxes, which is not great, but we're going to see it can get a lot worse. Uh, 
but I do, yeah, I want to note there's some similarities there. I also want to note that I do think this is cute. It is the official position of the Australian government uh, because of Hutt River. You can declare yourself a micronation in Australia. There's 14 of them that I could find because the government policy is just obey traffic laws and pay your taxes. And otherwise, you want to call yourself a prince or whatever? Sure. Yeah. That's fine. Probably not the weirdest thing going down in Australia. I'm going to be honest with you. I believe there is a place claiming to be the Empire of Atlantis in Australia that uh, <laughs> still, has, still has its doors open. So you want to visit that, we can do it. Does it have a coastline? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I haven't looked that much into it. It's yeah, potential future episode, maybe, if they've got any tax issues. Uh, and of course, the other side of this is the question of how do you legally define statehood? We can all agree the principality of Hutt River is not really a country, but it is true that legally what is or is not a country is kind of funky. There's no like fixed international definition of what a country is, which is why trying to determine legitimacy in a legal sense is hard to do because basically most countries exist because they have a history of being recognized as existing. Uh, it's just kind of like, because we accept it, it's real. Yeah, that, um, is something, that is something that does come up a lot on this podcast. There are, there are such things as international courts, but all of the rules that they set and the uh, rulings that they give out, those are only really as valid as the countries willing to recognize them. Um, there, there isn't really such a thing as a like world governing body that decides what is and isn't a country. And as we've seen lately in the political discourse, there are times when the fact that there is no world governing body determining what a country is cause some complications geopolitically. Absolutely. Uh, but on that note, if you've now ever wondered how to declare yourself prince of your own country, uh, you know now how to do it. So uh, when you want to mail us our uh, knighthoods for our help in that endeavor of declaring yourself a prince or duke or whatever, uh, how can people reach us? You can find us on our website, facingbackward.com. I would prefer to be a count uh, just because I think it's funny and you can do some puns with that. Uh, you can also tell me about my counthood. Uh, through our Patreon, patreon.com slash facing backward and pledge some of your royal support. You can tithe to your you can be a patron of the arts uh, as befits someone of your majesty. And special thanks to our noble patrons, the Medici of the modern day who pledged at our shout out tier. You are Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostalker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Kieran Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prime, William, Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Kat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, an anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sy, Gil, Leslie Ikuda, Trash Taste Enjoyer, John, Christopher, Harrison Rees, Inue Enrio's Ghostbusters, Nihongo Kaizen.com, Shimao Toshio's History of Yapanesia podcast, Jennifer Pianzo, James, A House is a Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch Are Road Scholars Compared to Samuel Alito, Schmuck, and Everything Changed, When the Fire Nation, and also the Independent Hut River Principality Attacked. Until next time, folks, remember, you can always declare war on Australia to get full and immediate respect for your country.